Hello, and thank you for joining us today as we learn a little bit about some of the things that you can do to mitigate bots at the edge. I'm Tyler Paxton. I'm a product manager uh, with AWS. On the stage with me, I have Paul Bodmer, who's an engineering manager over uh, AWS Shield Advance. And then Paul Campbell, who is one of our customers and uh, head of delivery at Demon Solutions. Today, there are a few things that I'd love for you guys to be able to take away from this. Um, the first one is just to have a common understanding of the bot la landscape, uh, what a bot is and what they do. The second one is um, to understand some of the products that are available to you from AWS that you can use to help mitigate against bots, including um, some of the recently released AWS WAF features and functionality. The third thing is to understand AWS WAF security automations, what they are and how you can use them to build um, a more custom solution for you. And then lastly, to understand how Demon Solutions help their customer uh, by building on top of AWS uh, to provide a security, uh, customized security solution. If you're interested in other security topics, we have a few of them that might be interesting to you. Uh, the first one is defense in depth um, and how to build that uh, for your web applications. The next one is around um, architecture, architecture best practices for DDoS. And then the third one is using AWS WAF and AWS uh, Firewall Manager to protect your applications. Give you a moment to note the sessions if you'd like to attend those. So most people don't know this, but uh, the majority of bot traffic, or majority of any traffic online is bots. Uh, when I say bots, what I mean is automated traffic, so as opposed to organic human traffic. Um, it's really hard to pin down exactly what that number is because bots are you know, uh, tricky to identify precisely. Most people, uh, most sources, um, and AWS customers agree that it's probably somewhere between 60 and 70%, depending on your site and you know, the, uh, the interest of bots of getting to it. When we look at bots within that 60 to 70%, and not all of them are bad bots that you necessarily want to get rid of. Some of them are good bots. Roughly, it breaks down into about half. Now, when I talk about good bots or I talk about bad bots, that's a little bit subjective. So when, I'm gonna, when I reference a good bot, what I mean is something that a site operator, automated traffic that a site operator wants on their site. When I talk about bad bots, what I mean is automated traffic that a site operator or developer does not want hitting their, uh, their application. So some things, uh, even with good bots, you may want to be able to manage those and, and mitigate against them in some way. Um, it's pretty easy to do that. Most good bots follow some you know, common social norms, some good uh, bot etiquette. Uh, an example of some good bots are things like crawlers. Uh, crawlers will go out and they'll, they'll, they're what power search engine optimization and makes it so that when we search for things that we want, like a toy robot dog, we can find it. Uh, and so site operators want that, consumers want that, everybody's happy. Another example of that might be a scraper. Um, typically when somebody hears scraping, they're gonna think that's a bad bot. Um, but again, it depends on the use case and it depends on what the site operator wants. Some site bot operators really like scrapers that go out and maybe pull coupon codes to make them easy to search and drive traffic to their site, or maybe do price comparisons that make it easy for customers to identify them and they're a you know, low cost provider, so that's, uh, that's useful for the site owner. Uh, and also useful for you know, the end user as well. Uh, in addition, there's other mundane, you know, good bot examples out there. Things like automation tooling, testing QA bots, m site monitoring for making sure that the site is, you know, up and reliable. And that again helps site operators and helps us, uh, helps consumers as well. So some of the things that these bots do, they'll, um, good bots typically, you know, would use an API if it were available. Site operators like that. As a developer, you can make an API available to the bot. That means they're consuming exactly what you want them to consume and the way you want them to consume it. It allows you to enforce access using maybe an API key or to enforce rate limits, things like that. Um, it also you know, it makes it easier for you to segment out bot traffic from real human traffic because they can consume that directly. Uh, but not all sites have an easy to consume API and you know, sometimes it's better for a bot to consume the website directly, um, like in the example of a, a crawler for search engine optimization. Um, in those cases, most bots, good bots are going to self-identify. 
Um, for a site owner, that's really helpful because they self-identify, you know who they are, you can also enforce some sort of rules around them. Usually they're going to self-identify with their user agent telling you who they are. One of the ways that you can enforce that is using robots.txt uh, uh, file, and just in the root directory of your site. It tells, uh, this is a big long list of all the directories that bots shouldn't and, and can access. Uh, if we were to scroll down in an example of this, uh, you would see specific bots. You might tell them that they can access other things or they can't access specific things. Again, good bots are going to obey all of this. So this is pretty easy as a developer to manage. Uh, bots are also going to uh, respect things like meta tags for no follow and no index, which uh, essentially tells them not to um, follow links on that page. Um, and um, you know, a, an example of that is going to as one bot is the common crawl bot. So common crawl is out crawling websites to make it easy to create a um, uh, easy to consume uh, set of data that people can use for machine learning or whatever it is that they want to build their own search engine. In this case, the common crawl bot here, it self-identifies using the user agent, CC bot. Uh, and so it's easy to know exactly who it is. You can Google CC bot, search for it, find out, okay, CC bot is common crawl. You can understand, and they'll give you instructions of how to manage them. They even mention a crawl delay, which is an unofficial thing in robots.txt that lets you, um, that lets you tell the bot how frequently in seconds it, that bot could, should crawl your site. Um, it's, it's unofficial, so you know they don't have to do that, and you, maybe you would want to treat them as a bad bot if somebody was you know not respecting uh, on that, and that's your choice as a developer. Typically, though, good bots are going to meter their request, even if you don't have that in there. They're not going to make several requests where they can take your site down, and then also good bots are going to you know purposely try to maintain uh, and respect the caching of content, so they're not abusing you know whatever um, uh, bandwidth cost you might have. So we talked about some good bots and you know, what you can do about them, why they might exist. Let's talk about some bad bots. Um, you know, bad bots might be those, just those bots that don't do the things that the good bots do. There are also more nefarious bad bots that are purposely being malicious. They're purposely being malicious. They're doing things like a distributed denial of service attack where they're trying to take your site down, trying to consume bandwidth, increase your cost, make it unavailable for whatever reason um, out there. If you want to learn more about some uh, of the aspects of DDoS attacks, we have a white paper available that's published um, by our uh, DDoS response team. Uh, our DDoS response team is a team um, that at AWS that manages not only all of AWS infrastructure, but uh, is available uh, to customers to help them mitigate against DDoS against their applications. Some of the things that our DDoS response team, team is, uh, has seen is over a million attacks uh, in the past year. That's roughly 160 DDoS attacks per hour, uh, which is a lot. Uh, most of those are mitigated automatically, and we just do that for you. Um, and uh, these, these DDoS attacks are large, not only in volume, but also in their scale. Um, seeing uh, attacks that are nearly one terabits per second, and also seeing on a single application attack that achieved uh, over a million and a half requests uh, per second. So outside of these network, that network type of attack that a bot might do on the network infrastructure, there are also application layer attacks that a bot could do. In the application layer, they might also be doing some sort of distributed uh, denial of service where they're overwhelming the application. They also might be doing things that you would typically find in the OWASP top 10, like SQL injection or cross-site scripting. Uh, or there might be other use cases um, that are also more targeted that you might find in the OWASP automated threats uh, handbook. Things like just doing generic vulnerability scanning, trying to find um, uh, opportunities to compromise systems, uh, to scraping aggressively. Again, this could be, uh, this is a potential good or bad bot, but if they're scraping really aggressively or trying to obtain content that as a site owner or developer, you don't want them to obtain as, uh, automatically. Um, and then there's also things that are uh, like a, a account takeover. Um, and this is a scenario, this is something we see a lot um, with our customers where uh, credentials that are stolen from one site 
are used by automated attacks to try those credentials at several other applications to see if they will are the same there. And then they'll gain access to those compromised accounts and then um, there's several things that they could do with that, either getting access to per, uh, uh, um, personally identifiable information or other information or just abusing other aspects of that account. Uh, now when we talk to our customers about why they're concerned about bots instead of it, outside of just the use cases, um, these are some of the things that they tell us about. On the infrastructure side, they're concerned about the increased infrastructure cost. If over half of your traffic are coming from bots that you don't want, you're spending half of your infrastructure cost on, on traffic you don't need. Uh, bots also cause downtime and instability. Uh, that might result in lost income. It also means that you know, your operations teams, your security teams are uh, occupied trying to manage and mitigate these bots instead of doing other things that might be more productive uh, for the organization. In addition, our customers tell us on the application side, they're concerned about things like stolen data um, you know, co through comprom uh, compromised uh, credentials and what might become of that in terms of loss of goodwill with their customers or their users and any financial repercussions that might come from that. Uh, our customers are also con concerned, concerned about things that bots do like generating fake accounts and spam and being able to mitigate it against that and how that impacts the perception of their product and the quality of their product. Now, when we talk about bots, they're not all, not all bots are um, made the same. Uh, you know, there are bots in the most simple form that do things that are very easy to detect. Um, some of the things that they'll do are use known automation tools, maybe commercially available automation and scraping tools, um, and they're easy to identify. Um, not purposely, they're not trying to say that, but because they use them out of the box, they, they're easy to identify. They also typically are run um, not very distributed, so they will maybe just come from a single device uh, behind a single IP address, and so it's easy to track them there and block them there. Or frequently, the bots will do just enough to get the content uh, a response, um, but they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't make a request with all of the data, metadata that you would ex expect in the request. And so they're easy to identify. They may be missing headers, have headers out of order, have weird characters in their headers, something like that. And that's all pretty easy to mitigate. We could come up with a set of rules and we can block those, some sort of static heuristics. What happens then is that the bots that are blocked, they begin to evolve. And they start, they start to become less simple, or they move on. Uh, but if they're, really, if they're persistent, they're going to evolve and they're going to spend resources in evolving to get around that. Some of the things that they're going to do to evolve are make sure that they do all the things that a human would do on the site and that they're going to look like a real browser. So they're going to make sure they execute JavaScript. When the JavaScript executes, it's going to allow the, all the you know, extra cookies to be generated that a site's going to expect. It's going to you know, allow the site, your site to generate um, you know, a valid fingerprint if that's something that you're doing. So now you sort of know, okay, I've got a bot. The bot's not just coming, not just, it's not easy to detect just from the user agent and headers. It's doing all this other stuff. Uh, it looks like it's got the cookies, all the headers it needs. Now I'm gonna, uh, maybe I can track it by device ID and I can start to block maybe too many requests from a device ID. Now those bots are gonna do other things to try to, to hide as well. They're also gonna hide by mimicking human behavior, moving mouse, their mouse, make, generating touch events on the screen. And then also going as far as emulating human workflows. So if they were trying to scrape data on the site, instead of going right to the page with that information, they'll make sure they hit the home page first, maybe go to the about us, do things that a human might do that a bot wouldn't necessarily have to do to accomplish their objective. And that allows them to hide in normally human looking traffic. And then finally, bots are going to distribute widely uh, their attack. They're going to use multiple IP addresses. They're going to mask the origin of those IP addresses. So if they were using IPs that were hosted somewhere, they might route those requests through a VPN, specifically looking for a VPN maybe that offered residential IPs, so they, again, blended in with real humans. Now, that's a lot of effort on the bot side. They're clearly investing time and energy into making their bot look as human as possible. What that means is that as a developer or a site owner, you also are going to have to are going to end up having to spend a lot of time to mitigate against them. Uh, we think of this as a little bit of a shared responsibility model. On the one hand, there's a lot that you can do with your site to ensure that when a bot comes, that you're able to handle maybe some increased traffic load from it, um, that you have 
appropriate configurations in place to make it um, easy to, to manage and mitigate against them, also including things like alerting and monitoring. Um, for example, you could look and see if you have too many requests coming, also, all of a sudden a spike of requests coming into your login page, too many error codes being generated, things like that that help you to understand what's going on with your traffic. On the other side, you can engage with uh, somebody like AWS to off that offers a DDoS service or some sort of web application firewall to do that or another service to help you uh, mitigate against bots. I wanna go specifically into some of the AWS offerings that we have today um, in, uh, in those areas. We offer um, several things. Our goal on this team, so Paul, uh, Paul Bodmer and I both sit within our edge services team that includes things like CloudFront, Route 53. Uh, we are specifically on the application security side. So our goal is to protect our customers, to give you the tools and, and products that you need to protect your applications, but also to uh, protect AWS architect, uh, infrastructure as a whole. And then finally, to provide an easy way for not only developers, but also partners to integrate with those products to make them stronger and uh, uh, help them to evolve and, and protect you. So some of the products that we offer first are AWS Shield. Shield is a basic DDoS service. Uh, if you've never heard of it, um, it uh, that's, uh, that's, I was gonna say that's great, but it's not necessarily great that you haven't heard it, but you're getting it for free today already. AWS Shield is on by default for anybody protecting uh, CloudFront, um, Route 53, API Gateway, and ALBs. So this is something that you can take, you're taking advantage of. We also have AWS WAF, which is our web application firewall. We have AWS Firewall Manager that allows you to manage your, uh, your WAF policies and enforce them, and also recently announced that you can manage your security group policies as well. And then finally, we have AWS Shield Advanced. AWS Shield Advanced is our advanced DDoS mitigation. This comes with a few things. It gives you um, improved DDoS protection. It gives you uh, managed, so you have a dedicated, t a managed DDoS protection with a dedicated DDoS response team. Uh, you also get things like um, bundled uh, WAF included in that on protected endpoints. And uh, also you get cost protections in the event that you, uh, there is some sort of a successful DDoS attack against uh, your application. We've released these over time. We began very simply starting off with the most simple bots. We've evolved to try to keep up with the evolving bot landscape. Um, you can see some of the timing around that. This is not something brand new in terms of the products, but we are constantly evolving them. Most recently, we introduced some improvements to the AWS WAF um, that I'm gonna take a couple of slides to talk about. Uh, one, we made it so that it's, uh, uh, you can now write hundreds of rules, whereas previously you could only write up to 10 uh, before you had to ask for a limit increase. Um, we also made writing the rules a lot more uh, simple and easy to manage by making them document-based and making the API to update the rules more streamlined and, and to making the console easier to work with as well. And then we also added new detection capabilities. The primary uh, thing that we've done in the detection capabilities is introduced AWS managed rules for AWS WAF. This is a set of managed rules that you can turn on on your um, uh, protected endpoints. Um, one of the things that you'll see here, well, so a couple of things about this. The manage, these rules are managed by our threat response uh, research team. Uh, they're based on intelligence that we get, we've gathered within Amazon. And we have things in here like a core rule set that's based on the OWASP top 10. You can see over here on the right, the WCU is a WAF capacity unit. So instead of limiting you just on the number of rules, we're limiting you on the amount of, uh, the amount of uh, essentially computational capacity that your rules can take up. So we now allow up to, uh, we have these WAF capacity units. We allow up to 1,500 WAF capacity units. Uh, for an example, if you were doing a simple rule previously that was just looking at geography, today that would equate to one WAF capacity unit. So you get way more, um, uh, way more op opportunity to write rules here. You also could see what the capacity units were for some of the uh, AWS managed rules. For example, the core rule set is 700, the Amazon IP reputation list is 25, and then you still have you know, 775 additional capacity units that you can use up with your own custom rules on top of that. 
So as you can see, our approach here is to offer many opportunities for you to protect, uh, your, uh, protect your application. We're gonna jump into each of these and, and, and talk about where in each of these layers you can do something and what you can do to help mitigate against bots. Uh, and I'm gonna turn the time over to Paul to start talking about some of those. Thanks. All right, guys. Um, so let's jump straight into it. We're gonna talk about how you can protect your network infrastructure first. Uh, so, Tyler's already mentioned the benefits of Shield and what it does. What I wanted to stress here is that this provides you with uh, a um, defense against common and frequently occurring transport and network layer DDoS attacks. Uh, so if you're running um, anything in the cloud in AWS today, this is already um, enabled and protecting you. Furthermore, if you've got CloudFront sitting in front of your application um, and you're using Route 53, that is giving you a base, a really strong base to work off uh, in protecting your network infrastructure. You can take more actions. Um, first off, uh, you can enable Shield Advanced. So again, Tyler's told you what the service is, um, but the key feature I, I wanna talk about here, um, one of the key features is the alerting that you can set up. So Shield Advanced provides you with um, some metrics that you can consume and you can configure CloudWatch alarms on. Um, these metrics will alert you when there's anomalies detected in uh, your traffic. Um, so if there's significant deviations from the traffic uh, that we've, the historic tr uh, observations we've, we've gathered from uh, traffic coming into your uh, application, as well as if there's any s deviations from, uh, you know, s specific HTTP characteristics, then this will alert you. And it will say, hey, there's something going on in your traffic go and investigate. And then, it, then it's over to you, if the, that alarm is configured, to go in and look at the traffic and say, um, do I want to take any specific action here? Or you know, is this traffic expected? Uh, maybe I need to scale a bit more, et cetera. Um, this is an example of um, a, re a request flood, actually. Um, and there's a lot of detail there on the Shield um, advanced uh, console that allows you to then go and, in this case, you could write a WAF rule for uh, maybe a, a destination or a source country that's coming out. Um, so the other benefit of being a Shield Advanced subscriber is that we can take your network access control list that you have configured within your VPC, and we can mirror that config in a tool that we have that sits much closer to the incoming network. Uh, the AWS network. So any ingressing traffic, uh, we can apply what you've got set up in your VPC. What this means is uh, we can block traffic right at the ingress point before it even reaches your infrastructure, um, which saves you money um, and also provides additional protection. So this is a tool that we have called Blackwatch, and uh, you can work with the DDoS response team to implement uh, a solution like this. So let's take a look at managing simple bots. Um, the first thing we, I want to talk about is the uh, IP rule, the IP list, the Amazon IP list that comes from uh, the AWS managed rules for WAF uh, that we've launched, AMR. Uh, Tyler mentioned it's based off Amazon intelligence, is this, and this is one of the rule sets that's, that has that intelligence in it. It's essentially a blacklist of IPs that has been collected uh, from the teams within Amazon, and it's a really quick way to just protect your uh, application from known, uh, you know, malicious bots and malicious actors. Uh, so this is really quick and easy. I put a screenshot there for you of the actual manage rules uh, console, and at no additional cost, you can just go there and add to Web ACL, and it's protecting your application. On WAF Classic, there is a solution called uh, AWS WAF Security Automations. This also contains an IP reputation list, which again is a nice quick win for you. Um, this is not available today currently for the new version of the API that was released last week, uh, but I imagine in the fullness of time it will be. Um, however, every uh, individual component that I talk about within this uh, WAF Security Automations, you can build on the new version of WAF. Um, it's just not available in the solution. Uh, if you're not familiar with this solution, it's a CloudFormation script 
Um, so let me just explain the solution quickly before I go into some of the more details. It's a, a cloud formation, if you don't know, it helps you to script uh, architecture um, design and you can then build that template automatically. Uh, what this template does for you is it builds a web ACL and it has a number of rules inside of it. Uh, for example, whitelisting, blacklisting, uh, IP rules, also um, some standard rules protecting you against SQL injection and cross-site scripting, a DDoS a rule to protect you against HTTP floods, and then um, additional rules on some uh, scanners and probes, IP reputation list, which I'm going to go into detail now, and bad parts. We'll talk about those three in a bit more detail now, but this is a really nice, if, you, if you've not got anything in terms of AWS WAF today, you can run the script. It's a one click. Uh, there's a uh, screenshot from the actual website. So launch the solution in AWS console and it builds the solution for you. Um, here you can see the parameters that you just specify in the um, actual CloudFormation script and it's straightforward to use. What you get at the end of the, end of the day is something like this. Uh, all of these resources are different aspects of a solution that are contributing to your AWS uh, web, WAF web, web ACL. We're going to dig into this now. So let's look at the IP reputation list. How this works is it's a CloudWatch event that's created for you. A CloudWatch event is uh, you can configure an event to trigger if um, something happens, like maybe your DynamoDB table is updated, but you can also configure them to to run on a schedule. In this case, it's configured to run every hour and it triggers a Lambda function that uh, fetches data from third-party publicly um, available reputation lists and it takes those IPs and updates it into your WAF. So here is the list of parameters that go in that uh, the CloudWatch event sends to the Lambda function. You can see the URLs for uh, the lists that we're consuming. Um, they're, they're fairly well known. Um, and then the other, the other parameters that we're specifying there is the IP, um, the IP set rule that you want to update within your WAF. This Lambda function, uh, here's some of the code that is run. Um, so in step one, we're looping through the current IP set and we're checking if the IPs that are currently in, that, in, in your web ACL are um, in the list of side ranges that have come from the publicly known lists. Um, if they're not, we're, we delete them in step two. And then in step three and four, we're starting to interact with the WAF API. And here we're getting a change token and then we're updating the new IP set in step four. Um, this has all changed. Uh, I wanted to put this here because um, if you've worked with a WAF API, you'll know that you need to get a token and then you need to update a condition. And then you need to get a token and you need to update a, um, a rule. And then you need to get a token and you need to update your web ACL. So um, the new version of WAF, the latest release for the APIs, has made this now a JSON file that you upload. Just one, um, two calls to the API with a JSON file that's got all the details in it. So it's way simpler now on the new version to update a WAF. And then at the end of the day, you're left with an IP list, um, blacklist inside your, your WAF to protect you from um, these known bad actors. The code for this, the, the, the other reason I'm showing you the code here is because you can go ahead and customize this yourself, right? Take this code, perhaps you've got an S3 bucket or a DynamoDB table where other parts of your company are giving you IP addresses that they want to block. Um, maybe there's other sources you want to integrate with. Um, here you can go and edit the code and you can build something custom for yourself. Uh, so let's take a look at how you can protect against some other application threats uh, from advanced uh, bots. Uh, the first thing I want to say is rate-based rules um, is part of uh, what is created in the WAF security automations, but you can obviously do this manually in the new version of WAF. Uh, this is important for volumetric attacks. So typically HTTP floods will um, exploit uh, seemingly legitimate uh, gets or post requests to an application. And 
uh, this rule will help you uh, minimize the impact of, that, of such an attack. Uh, so in this case, you can define, I, I've defined some conditions to match on. So I'm particularly concerned about traffic going towards my login page, and I'm only concerned about posts in this, situ in this case, and um, I'm worried about a certain amount of traffic coming from country X. So in this case, I've said 100 requests per five minutes. If that rate is breached, um, start blocking requests coming from that IP. An example of how this looks in CloudWatch. So here's a, here's a graph from CloudWatch where I'm tracking um, blocked and allowed requests. So you can see that uh, I've got two IPs. One is sending 10 requests per minute, which is 50 requests over the five minute window. That is um, below the rate that I've configured in the rule. And the other one, the second IP is doing 125 requests per five minutes, which exceeds the rate of 100 in the fourth minute. So you can see that indicated by the blue uh, in the graph. Those are the blocked requests. So both IPs send, and once the rate is uh, exceeded by IP number two, those, that IP starts being blocked. A, s a common situation that we're dealing with with uh, quite a few customers nowadays is credential stuffing attacks. Um, Tyler did mention this. And, and these, these are, uh, can be quite sophisticated and tricky to uh, defend against. This is an approach you can use to defend against credential stuffing. Um, what we're doing here is we're consuming the logs from CloudFront and ALB, and we're using those logs, uh, we're parsing those logs through a Lambda function or Athena. You can choose which option you choose, uh, you can choose which option um, that works best for you. Uh, you know, if you've got massive logs, it might be better to go with, S, with uh, Lambda. Uh, for cost reasons, or if your logs aren't that big, Athena might give you additional func query uh, func uh, functionality. But at the end of the day, both of these options will um, find out malicious IPs from the logs and upload it into WAF. So why are we using logs from, the A from ALB or CloudFront? It's because those logs contain the response from your application, right? So a credential stuffing attack typically will result in um, a login attempt failing, for example. So your application might, may respond with a 403 error, saying permission denied. You might respond in a different way, depending on how you've uh, programmed your application. But here what we're saying is, um, I want to define a threshold of 403 errors. In fact, I've got you know, 400 to 405 errors there, that um, if the threshold is breached by an IP, that is returning these errors um, only for the login page, then I want you to block that IP. Okay, so this allows you, um, essentially what you're doing here is you're allowing the Lambda function to manage the rate instead of using the WAF rate, ba rate based rule. Here you're allowing Lambda to do it so you can consume and understand your application's response and then update an IP blacklist with any IPs that um, breach the threshold. Another solution is to use a honeypot. So in this situation, a honeypot is a technique that lures bad bots and captures their IPs. Uh, it's a fairly well-known solution. The WAF security automations template builds this for you, okay? Um, it builds an API endpoint, um, and I've, I've called it slash honeypot. You can change that to whatever you want, um, but that path is then added to your CloudFront distribution and any traffic that goes through to that API, uh, the IP address is then captured through a Lambda function and then put straight into your WAF so that that actor can't return again. And it leverages the robox.txt file. So over here, we're, uh, if you remember, Tyler said that good bots observe what you suggest um, or what you ask them to do in that, in that file. Uh, so here, what we're doing is we're saying, um, do not go to my path slash honeypot. Um, and that's important because we're assuming that a bad bot is going to ignore that and is going to go to that link. Um, and so to set this up, if you've got a CloudFront distribution, you're def you just define a, a second behavior or an, another behavior. In this case, um, I've only got two, and the, the one goes to my application. 
The other one goes to slash honeypot, um, or it actually goes to an API endpoint that is created for you. Uh, and um, the origin of that path or the origin of that behavior is the API. Um, you also have to add a link. You have to embed a link into your website so that it can be clicked. I mean, you can see there, as long as you use the same path, you're fine. So slash honeypot, you click on that. What it does is it takes you to this API, which then calls this Lambda function. In this Lambda function, we're looking at the X forwarded four headers, and we're saying, give me your IP address, source IP for that request. Um, we take that source IP, we put it into a WAF IP set, and we upload it. And then we respond back to the bot saying, thumbs up, thanks for the visit, um, please come back later. So what you're left with is an IP set that has only um, IPs from bad bots that have gone and ignored your uh, robots.txt file. This again is a really helpful um, strategy. You can also um, use this Lambda function for um, extending it for more customizable uh, features that are more applicable to your application if you'd like to do that. So we mentioned AWS managed rules uh, for AWS WAF. Here are some managed rules for AWS WAF that are written by external partners. Um, so they're available on the marketplace, which has thousands of software listings uh, by independent software vendors. All of these software vendors that you see here um, provide, um, on WAF Classic, they provide a managed rule set. And uh, currently, at, uh, today, we have Fortinet and CSC that have migrated some of their rule sets over to the new WAF API. But these rule sets are really designed to help protect against common uh, application uh, vulnerabilities. And there are even some ones that are specifically designed for bot detection. So F5 and Fortinet have a specific um, bot detection uh, uh, rule sets that you can then apply to protect yourself against scrapers or um, other um, scanners and uh, well-known types of bots. You can access this through the WAF console. There is a marketplace link on the WAF console that takes you directly to these uh, rule sets. Of course, integration with a third party is also available. So, Datadome, Imperva, Casado, Sequence, Shape, Perimeter X are all examples of independent, um, uh, independent vendors that have a managed uh, bot protection service. These, um, we've, it, we've tried to make it possible to integrate with these guys so that you can use this as another tool in your pocket to, to um, improve your security posture. Most of these vendors will integrate slightly differently and have their own, uh, own flavor. Uh, however, the most common integration is they expose an API endpoint to you, and you just call that API with some characteristics of the HTTP request, and they can respond back to you with, uh, you know, allow this through or uh, block it, or we're not sure this looks suspicious, present the user with a, a capture and allow them to prove their identity. Um, in this case, we're leveraging the Lambda at Edge uh, event uh, on viewer request. So that triggers when the viewer request hits your distribution. All right, so as it arrives at the distribution, it triggers the Lambda function, it calls the API, and um, responds back. Uh, if, if it's a deny, the, the request never reaches your backend. All right, it turns around at CloudFront and responds back with a 403 uh, to, the, to the bot. Um, so again, um, this is a great way to add additional protection to, um, to your application security posture. So what you might end up with is something that looks like this. It's a layered approach. Uh, you've got shield up front. Um, you've leveraged some of the WAF security automations. You've uh, leveraged um, uh, potentially uh, API from a third-party bot vendor. And really, all together, this is giving you a comprehensive uh, you know, solution for bot mitigation. So I've been saying that 
uh, all of these tools are available for you to build on. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Paul uh, from Demon Solutions, and they built some really innovative things, and I'd like you to talk us through it. Thanks a lot, Paul. Cheers. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm here to talk about bot mitigation and WAF augmentation with Enterprise Retail. So I'm Paul Campbell, I'm Head of Delivery at Demon Solutions. Uh, we're a technical consultancy based in the UK. Uh, we're an advanced partner within AWS um, and we focus on our customers through ca uh, cloud, machine learning and software engineering. Um, we're super passionate about making sure uh, technology can help our customers. So I'm here to talk a little bit around retail. So firstly, I'd just like to say thank you to AWS for inviting me here to talk about our experiences. So thank you very much, guys. Um, so look, Deem and ourselves, we work in multiple sectors. Retail is a big one that we work in very heavily. Um, so with retail, it's, it's, as it's moving more into an online space, it's becoming more and more important that you consider security. Um, and you need to make sure that you know, you're protecting yourselves from malicious activity. The common types of attacks that we see, so look, Tyler and Paul have both mentioned things like DDoS attacks, credential stuffing, they're really heavily used within retail. I mean, it's a big business, it's a multi-trillion uh, multi multi -trillion dollar business, um, so it's, you know, it's super important that you're focusing on the right stuff and making sure that you're uh, protected from both a brand and a customer perspective. So in all of this, the customer experience is paramount. You, know, you must be secure, you must be performant, um, but you, know, you need to make sure that you're providing your customers that you're giving them the right protection so that they feel safe when they're using your, your kind of websites and things like that. So look, despite all the high demands from our customers, you need to make sure that you know, security isn't a trade-off. It's something that you always have to consider. So depending on the size of your business, you need to assess how far you need to go to protect your assets. For enterprise, it's sophisticated, it's creative and it's automated. So, I mean, the whole thing is like an arms race, you know, they will push super hard, you'll push back super hard, and it's a constant battle. It's, you know, it's, it's constantly evolving. And it's, 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 it's really important to make sure that you're aware that all of these attacks are generally automated. So the only way you can kind of protect from automation is defending with automation, super important. And a lot of you are probably sitting there going, well, if it happens to me or when it happens to me, it's neither of those. It's always, and it's happening right now. So you need to make sure that you're always protecting yourself. I liken a lot of this stuff to a game of chess. So, you know, you're, you're playing against the Grand Master. Generally, he's thinking two, three, four, five moves ahead, you know, trying to work out what's his kind of strategy of what he needs to do to be better. And you need to do the same. So this is where it becomes super important that your design is at the forefront of your mind when you're kind of building these solutions. So it's not an afterthought, you know, it's something you need to do at the outset of the design of your systems. So look, very quickly, I just want to take you through um, a high level kind of architecture that we've generally worked with with a lot of our customers. Um, I'm going to focus around the additional things that we've put in place over on top of the security automations. Um, but look, I'm just going to go through it very quickly. So what we have is your kind of standard layout with AWS WAF, um, CloudFront and your application load balancers that's dealing with the traffic to your applications. So generally, you know, we're seeing the requests come in, they hit CloudFront. What we're doing at the front, we have a Lambda Edge function that we kind of sit there and its job there is specifically just to capture um, the origin response. So there's, there's multiple types of CloudWatch, um, sorry, not CloudWatch, CloudFront uh, events. And what we're doing is capturing origin response. That, and that's literally all we're doing. We're stuffing that into a DynamoDB database. And effectively, then the next stage of that is we then have some internal forensics that we kind of use to make sure that we can kind of do some checks around the information that we're seeing. So we kind of have the first one over here, which is the analyze one. And this, what this essentially does, we pass this off to a third party reputation organization who essentially check that IP address, tell us if it's kind of a known bad IP address or not. At this point, if it comes back and it's good, we kind of forget about it, store it in the database and everything's good. If it's bad, we then do some further analysis around that information. So what we'll then essentially do is look through our application logs, look through the WAF logs, have, try and understand what the customer is actually doing or the bad bot of what it's actually doing and effectively trying to work out if the customer, customer behavior is what we expect. So we've done quite a lot of analysis on what our customers are doing and if, if, if what they're doing is the correct thing. So 
after we've done that analysis, if we have decided it's a bad bot and we then want to pass that through to, to our WAF, we then have a Dynamo um, DB again. So it's a, dy a dynamic IP block list database that we kind of store certain information in. Within there, we store the, the IP. Uh, we can store some other ca characteristics against that as well. So essentially, we can set how long we want to block that, block that IP for. So typically, we don't do this forever, but generally we do this for maybe a four hour period, maybe longer. It kind of depends on what you want to tune it to. Essentially what happens then, we have a secondary Lambda that its only job is effectively then to run every minute and update our WAF block list. So extended capabilities around this as well. What we've done is we've made that Dynamic IP block list database um, accessible from other parts of the businesses as well. So you know, often you have people from your security department come along and say, we've kind of had some intel, there's a bad, you know, a bad range of IP addresses, we want to make sure they're blocked. We've now given them the capability to upload that into that database. And again, when that Lambda runs, it then automatically, uh, automatically blocks them on the WAF, which is great. So look, that's the high level run through of the architecture. Um, I kind of want to take you through some of the key metrics that we kind of see and observe on a normal day. So generally here, the request load that the solution is handling, it's around 4,000 uh, 4, requests over a five minute period. Um, typically within kind of attack mode, when we're kind of seeing lots of bad bots coming at us and attacking us, that can kind of go up to 10,000, 20,000 kind of requests over a kind of short period of time. And, you know, again, this is where the automation really, really helps. So, the other thing that we kind of talked about earlier was ensuring that we don't impact the customer experience too much. So what we've found is that um, with lots of tuning around how we're kind of monitoring this stuff is generally we're adding about 10 milliseconds onto the customer's kind of request, which in most cases is kind of like invisible to the user. But this is something where you really need to focus on the, you know, the interested URIs only. So the things like your logins, your password resets, or kind of other important endpoints that you see on your site that potentially bad actors could kind of um, maliciously attack. So we talked briefly as well around the Lambda function. So every minute we run that, and that will update our block list. But you know, that's, that's down to your preference. If you want to kind of shorten that window, you want to run it every 10 seconds, every 20 seconds, that's fine. But you, know, you kind of need to assess that based on what your requirements are. And look, another thing that a lot of people are probably sitting there thinking is this is a really expensive solution to kind of manage. And you know, we're typically seeing on a normal day, the way that we've tuned the system, it's no more than the price of a cup of coffee. So look, you know, you want to take your business case to your CISO or something like that, or you know, I can't see anybody saying no at $5 a day to protect your website. And even again, on really bad days, we're typically seeing $50 to $100 a day, which again, super cheap if you're protecting your customers. So look, there's some of the key metrics that we've kind of run through. I just want to talk about some of the things that we had to consider as well. This wasn't all plain sailing when we first implemented these, uh, these solutions. So the first one to consider is around cost. So if you don't tune this correctly, it will cost you to the earth. So I think on day one, when we first implemented this, we monitored all traffic coming through our WAF. It was costing us about $2,000 a day. So yeah, I, I, <laughs> our manager wasn't very happy, but you know, it's something that we, we kind of tuned and we worked, worked through. And like I said, we've got that down to about $5 a day now. So the kind of main focus point around this is interested URIs only. Don't try and protect everything. You know, there are parts of your website that you don't really care if, you know, if people are hitting. It's, it's more about making sure that you're protecting those really, really important endpoints. So another thing as well around monitoring. So one of the things that we had to make sure that we did is set up the right CloudWatch dashboards with the right information. So we had a lot of standard information from the WAF that we kind of get out of the box. But then what we did is put together a bunch of custom application metrics that effectively allowed us to see very quickly that when we were blocking things, what the impact to our site was. Because one of the things that we really need to make sure that we're doing is not blocking our customers, yeah, real customers. So we need to make sure that we're policing ourselves. we get the right feedback loops in place, we need to, you need, need to understand your traffic to a point where you can confidently block things and know that it's the right thing that it's doing. And then the part, last one is kind of split into two kind of sides. So it's around the speed of execution. So the first one is, don't slow down your customer experience. So we talked about that previously, 10 milliseconds. But you know, when we first put this on, I think we impacted customers. We put about 300 milliseconds to the request, which is a problem over time. So look, you need to make sure that you really focus on that and tune that appropriately. The second one is your Lambda functions as well. You, know, you want to be able to analyze the information, but you want to be able to do it quickly. So if you, if you build a monolithic kind of application, it's you know, not very performant. The same with your Lambda functions. You need to really focus on making sure you're creating modular kind of um, modular scripts, if you like, that execute and actually do things very, very quickly. 
Um, because the, the main point is that you want to be able to block your throats as quickly as possible. So look, that's the end of my kind of talk around our experience. I'm just going to hand you back over to Tyler and he's going to wrap up the session. Thanks. Hey, thanks Paul. <laughs> It's great to hear you know, some of the things that customers have done with the building blocks within AWS. Just as a recap of some of the things that we've talked about, um, you know, you're already getting advantage, taking advantage of AWS Shield if you're using uh, you know, CloudFront, API Gateway, or uh, an ALB, um, you, and, um, and other use cases as well. Um, if you don't already have AWS WAF enabled, you may want to enable that to be able to block against some common bot attacks. Um, take a look at AWS Shield Advanced, um, look at AWS uh, Firewall Manager to help you enforce policies throughout your organization uh, and get aud auditing and reporting on that. Um, you can also look at the AWS WAF security automations and either use those holistically or take parts of them or build on top of them. And then we also talked about some of the things that are available through engaging with you know, a, a dedicated uh, bot mitigation vendor or something like that. Uh, the, if you have other sessions you're planning on attending, that's great. It do, yeah, you don't have to stop learning at reInvent. There's also other ways for you to obtain training and certification. There's um, you know, 30 plus uh, free digital courses uh, on security related topics. Uh, for the fourth year in a row, according to Global Knowledge, um, having, they have the most difficult time finding qualified cybersecurity experts. So getting this, t getting this training and talent will help you uh, in that space. And most of these, many of these courses are free. Some of them are in-depth classes, uh, including an AWS security uh, engineering uh, classroom. And uh, we would love to take any other questions that you guys have outside in this area. It gets a little bit noisy, so we'll ask you to meet us outside down the hallway and find us and love to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you for attending our session today.